people. They need therapy. All right. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you all here. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, well, who would like to start today? I can start. <laughs> My name is Pat. I'm a water user. You Hi, know, Pat. All, this, <laughs> all this talk about sustainability, you know, I really wonder if we understand what sustainability means and, and in terms of water. And I, I, I kind of think of it, <coughs> excuse me, as a kind of like the bank account, right? You know, where we have all this great water resources on Vancouver Island in our streams and lakes and aquifers under the ground. And I think about it as, you know, that's our principle. And every year we get a little bit more interest coming in through our snowpack and our rain. And, and really, if we want to manage for the future and protect the principle for future generations, we have to use only the interest. And we have to be very careful about it. Yeah, it's an important issue. You know, my name's Chris. I'm a water user too, um, mm -hmm. and you know that that bank account image really really speaks to me. But it's not just the the money in the bank; it's the cash flow, and, and flow being the, the operative term. Um, I know where I live, uh, we're getting more and more of our of our income interest income in a relatively small part of the year, and the part of the year when I have to draw down the bank account. The summer is getting longer and hotter and drier, and, and because of that, I'm using more water. Uh, plus, you know, where I live, we've got a lot of neighbors, and, and they like lawns. I'm not so big on lawns, they're big on lawns. And so we're trying to make this, this interest that we're getting into our bank account in the, you know, a short period of time last longer and longer every year, and it's just getting harder to make it, to make it stretch. Well, my name is, is Kim, and, and uh, I think in terms of the water balance. And so when I think in terms of the water balance, it's about the, the topsoil sponge. And so in terms of the interest, you know, in terms of, of um, the depth of, 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 of the topsoil in the sponge, well, if you have a nice sponge, and, you know, when it comes to using water, you know, you, you, you use less, so let's maintain the balance. And, of course, the converse is if you, if you, um, if you have decreased um, uh, topsoil sponge, you have more runoff. And, of course, so you're using up your bank balance. So that's how I look at things. Yeah, I'm Ian, I'm a water user, too. And, <coughs> I, you know, I live in a watershed. And I, I think where I live, there used to be a wetland there or something like the sponge you're talking about. But now, now, Ian, is a watershed like a, a woodshed? <laughs> well, no, a watershed is, well, we're in a watershed right now. Everywhere you go, you're in a watershed. It's that whole area that collects the water that we use. And when we talk about that, that bank account, uh, the water we're withdrawing, uh, I, I can't help but think about the water quality, because if, if, if we use the water and maintain the quality, we can put it back so somebody else can use it later on. Yes. I'm Roger. I'm a water user. and I. Um, I think everything we've heard today is about how much water we have, where it comes from, mm -hmm. protecting watersheds. I don't think most people know that watersheds are actually public, are privately owned generally on Vancouver Island. Over 80% of the lands are actually privately owned versus publicly owned. Um, we think, or I think, that uh, if the communities know where their water comes from, mm -hmm. if they understand the bank account idea, that they will make decisions that will help save in the bank, help give us a savings account, and overall it'll be better for everybody, but we need the information out. Yes. My name's Ted, I'm a water user as well, and you know, I'm really kind of concerned, and I'm concerned that we may be the first society in history that doesn't really, uh, takes for granted where our food comes from. And I just brought a couple little, you know, I brought some food along and we're chopping the grocery store here. And, you know, people don't realize that, um, it takes water to make that cabbage grow. You know, land, water, dedicated people. You don't get food without water. And when we um, <clears throat> buy food from somewhere else in the world, we're really importing water as well. So we're really trading in virtual water when we start moving sh goods and services around the world. And so are our sustainable practices, are we buying food from elsewhere that have the same sustainable practices that we're trying to implement here on, in, on Vancouver Island? And you know, the other thing is, there are foods that you can grow that you may not, you can cut back on the water and you can still grow a bit of the crop. But then take a look at this apple, for example. Um, you can't grow half an apple. You can grow a smaller cabbage and still eat it, but you can't grow half an apple. So when a person is dedicated to their farm and they need to grow an apple that's productive and they can sell, 
they need the full allocation of water to be able to make that apple sellable on the market. Okay, because then I see that, that in a lot of ways, water usage, the agricultural lands, um, you take a lot of our water usage? Yeah, if you look actually on the world, 70% um, of the water use in the world goes to agriculture. It's about the same in the Okanagan. I think it's actually probably the same if you look at BC on a whole. 70% of our water goes to grow our food. The other interesting fact is that irrigated agriculture is only about 17% of our cropland in the world, but it produces 40% of our food products. You know, I know where I live, um, we're trying to grow more of the food that, that we eat, but uh, we have you know, some of the same kind of issues that you're talking about in, in terms of, of sponges. I discovered just the other day that if we were in, and I live just south of here in the Cowichan, that if we were to build out all of the land that we have according to the present zoning, about 20% of it would be covered in pavement, which means it wouldn't be available to grow food, and the water that lands on it would not be soaking into the ground to be used later. It would be running off, probably picking up a bunch of you know, oil and <clears throat> grease and other nasty stuff off the pavement and going straight to the sea because of the way we've chosen to, to rule on how that land's going to be used. Yeah, and that kind of stormwater runoff is that water we can't use again. And then, of course, what about the fish and other things in the ecosystem that depend on the quality of that water? So we have to find ways to develop more sustainable. And that brings us back to understanding the importance between land and water, and then people tend to often think in terms of the silos, whereas we're, it's all about respect for the land, because what you do on the land impacts on what, how much water you use and how much runs off and comes back to water sustainability on the supply side and the sustainability of your habitat. Exactly, and you know, a country like Canada is actually quite a lucky because we have a lot of land. But when you look at the world population right now, it takes about two and a half hectares per person on this world to sustain that person when we talk about energy, water, food, crops, and everything like that. Uh, we're pretty well there. And now Canada has land to give and areas to give, but other areas of the world don't, like Indonesia, where they obviously don't have two and a half hectares per person. So we get into that critical stage where we have to do better on everything, including our water, to become sustainable in the future. We can't continue to grow and allocate two and a half hectares per person. We all have to start making do with less. Because it takes a lot of water to, to produce certain things, as you're saying with cabbages or, or apples, but um, I know last week we were talking, Chris, and, and you know, even you know, talking about like for McDonald's or you know, looking at computer usage at all, it all comes down to water. Whereas we kind of take that for granted, don't we? It's a, it's a real problem, although I, I think a lot of people don't necessarily see that it's a problem. Well, it certainly um, is going to require us to make some choices because, again, it's, a, it's that bank account. You know, I can only so much water all summer long. Do I want to use it to wash the car or do I want to use it to grow a cabbage? You know, do we collectively want to use it to wash our cars, build our cars, uh, which is basically buying somebody else's water? or have enough to eat. And there's, you know, there's only so much water to go around, there's only so much water to get us across the summer. And uh, if we decide to use it for one purpose, it may not be available for, for another purpose, or we may use it in some fashion. For example, uh, you know, in some parts of this province, and we're thinking about doing some of the same things here, we export a lot of energy to, to other places. They're talking about, you know, there's some folks thinking about building a coal mine up north of here. We, we build a lot of, um, we, we pump a lot of natural gas up in the northeastern part of the province. We're, we're not focusing on the fact that it takes a lot of water to make that energy, and we're actually exporting virtual water when we export coal or when we export natural gas or our neighbors do it with oil. In effect, we could be shipping them water. If we ship them water, we'd get it back, actually, because, well, they would, you know, they, they'd use it in some fashion and we'd get it back. Shipping them the oil, we don't get the water back. Shipping them, you know, other things that involve ruining the water, we don't get the water back. So we'd have to start making choices about what's the most sensible way for us to use this water. That's a good point about sustainability and water use and, and understanding how it ties into energy and other things just besides using the water directly for our, our consumptive, consumptive purposes. Um, I know that uh, when we're looking at principles of sustainability and, and 
trying to project in the future how we're going to make our water go farther or treat it better, there's going to be a cost. There's going to be a cost for water treatment, a cost for protection. So we have to think of ways to, to pay for that because our water is cheap. Yeah, and building on what you said, I mean, in terms of you know how much water we have and, and, and efficiency in the bank account analysis or an analogy rather, what people often forget it's not so much how much rain falls in a year; it's our ability to store it and trap it. And so, effectively, we've used up all the easy places to store. It. And so, as the population grows, as we have more demand, we can't create any more storage. And so, that's what's forcing us to think about how we use water more efficiently because it's got to go further. Because we just can't go off and build another dam somewhere. And so, then, what are the implications? What are the solutions? <laughs> 